Today we are continuing our series of At The Movies, and what we do kind of every month of June is we look at different kind of famous Hollywood movies, and we look at the biblical truth that is hidden inside this movie. And I will admit, sometimes it's hidden really deep. <laughs> sometimes you gotta look really hard for it. Uh, now, confession time. Um, I'm not one of those kinds of Christians that walks around my life seeing Jesus in everything. Okay, I'm just not that guy. I know some Christians are. It's like, oh, look, there's a dead leaf. I see Jesus. Okay, it's like, oh, look, someone dropped some yogurt. I see Jesus. Some people are like, you just see Jesus everywhere, and that's awesome. I'm, I'm not that guy. Okay, I don't go to the movies basically expecting to see Jesus everywhere. Okay, but the reality is, is that God is a creator God. And God has imprinted into the heart of every single human being his image and his likeness. And even people who don't believe in God, even people who are rebellious against God, God uses them for his glory. He truly does. And so sometimes even in these stories, we can find the truth of who God is and how God works in the world through storytelling. And wasn't that actually the ministry of Jesus? Right, Jesus went from town to town, village to village, telling people stories. And people would hear these stories, and it would point people to the truth of God, point people to the truth of the character and nature of God, and how God's kingdom is working in the world. And it was done through stories. So that's kind of the purpose of this series, is to help open our eyes to the spiritual truth of God, and how he's working all over the place, and hopefully that raises our evangelistic temperature a little bit as followers of Jesus. As we deal with a culture that loves movies, how do we create spiritual conversations and point people to the truth of God? That's kind of the heart behind doing a series like this. And so what I want us to talk about today is a very interesting topic, and I, and I want to kind of kick this off. I, want, I always love starting this with a question because I want you thinking. I don't want you just hearing me babble for the next 40 minutes and then you go, <laughs> that was nice, Pastor Kevin, and then forget about everything we've talked about during our time together. I, I want this to stir in your heart. I, I do this so it changes you. <clears throat> right, and the question I want you to ask yourself today is, um, have you ever had a longing in your heart for something more? You know, that there's just this longing in your heart for something more. And, and maybe that for you, it's in your career. And, and you, you have a good job. And, and you like your job enough, and your job kind of pays the bills, and, you know, and, and it's a good job. But there's just this longing that, that your job should be something more. There should be something more to this. But you can't quite put your finger on it. Or maybe for others of you, it's in a relationship. Maybe it's in your marriage, for example. And your, your marriage is good. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no tension. There's no conflict. But there's just this longing for more. Maybe it's for some of you, it's with your finances. Your finances are good. Like you're in, you know, it's, it can always be better. <laughs> but your, your finances are kind of there. But there's a, kind of this just longing for more. There's this longing for something else. What I want to talk about is this longing that you and I have in our hearts. The Bible talks about that longing. And there's a couple of verses, or there's a verse in an, an Old Testament book called Ecclesiastes. And this book was written by King Solomon. And he wrote this as the wisest man who's ever lived. Right? King Solomon, he's this king that God said, what do you want? And I'm going to give it to you. And Solomon said, I want wisdom. Above all things, I want wisdom. So this wisest man who ever lived has this understanding of the human heart. And this is what he writes in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. He says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. You and I, as created human beings... Men and women, boys and girls, created in the image and likeness of God, deep within your heart is a longing for eternity. 
And, and maybe you're here today and, and you don't believe you're created. Like, but I'm just going to say what I believe. I believe you are a created human being. I do not believe you evolved from a monkey. I do not believe that there was a puddle of scum that was hit by lightning and now you're here. You were created in the image and likeness of a God who loves you. And you bear his image. But yet you and I have fallen. We live in sinful flesh. We live in a sinful world. There's a spiritual enemy named Satan who's attacking us each and every day. And so we have this eternity which is set in our heart. But you and I are incapable of truly fathoming God from beginning to end because of that sin in our lives. So what I want us to talk about today in our At The Movies talk today is I want us to talk about this longing for eternity in our heart and yet how we deal with it when temptation comes, when the world kind of hits us. What does this eternity in our heart, what happens to it? And in order to kind of look at those passages of scripture that we're going to look at today, I want us to use this movie as our backdrop. So watch this trailer. This stuff I really do. Um, if you are a guest with us today, I am that big of a geek, okay? Um, but this is the story about a guy named Dr. Stephen Strange. And Dr. Stephen Strange is a world renowned surgeon. He specializes in brain and spinal surgery, and he is the absolute best in the world. He is the doctor that everyone turns to for advice. He is the doctor that every sick person wants to be on his operating table because you know the operation is going to be a success. Dr. Stephen Strange is blessed with a photographic memory and hands that are so incredibly steady and precise that he can do surgery in the brain that every other doctor needs computers and, and machines to do that. But with that incredible skill also comes an incredible arrogance and pridefulness. In fact, Dr. Strange, he is quite willing and quite happy to point out everybody else's shortcomings. He's quite thrilled to point out to the other doctors that they're not as good as him or they're not as smart as him and that this patient would have died if he wouldn't have stepped in to save the day. But pride truly comes before the fall. And Stephen Strange finds himself on a rainy night crashing his fancy Lamborghini. He's on the phone because his arrogance has become so, so arrogant. That was a good sentence. His arrogance has become so arrogant, okay, that he has stopped taking patients based on their need and only would take patients that will further his career that he'll only accept a patient if it's guaranteed to succeed. Because he doesn't want to ruin his perfect reputation. It's not about who needs the care and who needs the help. It's about, will this further my place in the medical industry? So he's in this car crash, and his hands, his gift, is crushed when the car is smashed. And he spends the next several years having multiple surgeries and multiple treatments to try to get his life back to where it was. He's this rich man. He's this powerful man. He's this successful man. But with the loss of his hands, he now considers himself to be a nobody. So he d d puts everything into getting back the life that he once knew. And he spends all of his money and all of his resources. And finally, during his investigation, he learns of a man who was completely healed from completely shattering one of his vertebrae in his spine. And because Dr. Strange is an expert in the brain and the spine, he knows that that person should be a complete vegetable. Like there's no reason, there's no way that that person should still be walking, let alone playing basketball and living a normal life. But that person was completely healed. So Dr. Strange finds that guy and finds out he was healed in this small little village in Nepal. 
And so he literally spends his last dollar to get to Nepal in order to receive this healing. And Dr. Strange has his eyes opened to the reality of eternity. So let's watch this. The same is true for you and I. We live in a spiritual world, but we become so focused on the physical that we forget that there is a spiritual realm out there. We're so obsessed on the physical, our comfort, our ease, the things that we want in our lives. Everything becomes about the physical, and we lose focus. We take our eyes off of the eternal. But eternity is stamped in our hearts. And so we live in this tension of having this eternity stamped in our hearts, and yet all of our energy and all of our time focused on the physical. So we need to have our eyes opened, and that's why I think Ecclesiastes said that our heart longs for this, yet we cannot fathom what God is doing. So Stephen Strange begins this journey that so many of us go on as followers of Jesus, of how do we open our eyes to the ways of God? Stephen Strange goes on this journey of having his eyes opened to the reality of eternity. And he learns that a bunch of other sorcerers, led by the great sorcerer Cassilius, have lost their way. And what these other sorcerers have done is they've given in to the lies and the temptations of this dark lord from another universe, from another multiverse named Dormammu. And Dormammu has promised these sorcerers eternal life. Because the reality is, these people, these sorcerers have come to realize what humanity's greatest enemy is. And that's time. Your greatest enemy in your life is time. Either in the things that you are pursuing, the things that you are longing for, there's not enough time to accomplish it, or the reality that you and I have an expiration date stamped in us. Now, we don't know what that date is, but every single one of you, myself included, has an expiration date. Not only do you have an expiration date, you have a best before date <laughs> stamped on you. And you older people know exactly what I'm talking about with that, because you've gone past your best before date. You younger people have no clue what's coming. Okay, I turned 46 in April, and I'm convinced April the 11th, 2017 was my best before date. Because I went, I brought my dog for a walk yesterday. It's just this little dog. I bring this dog for a walk, and it's beautiful, and we're walking, and I blow out my knee. I didn't do anything. I'm just walking. What is this? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who you passed your best before date. You sleep at night and you wake up in excruciating pain. It's like I didn't do anything yesterday. I didn't work out. I didn't go to the gym. I didn't go swimming. And I just sat in my patio all day. And you wake up in pain. Time is our enemy. Time is the enemy. And these sorcerers have been promised a solution to the enemy of humanity. That they can live forever. But this dark lord is a deceiver. He's a liar. He's a trickster. And he is tempting these sorcerers to turn away from the true path. And the same is true for you and I as Christians in our culture today. That there is a dark lord. There is a spiritual enemy. There is a devourer who wants you to leave the path that God has for your life. And that person's name is Satan. And we can see Satan works on the hearts of men and women and boys and girls to move them away from the trueness of God and take away what God would have for you in your life. This longing that you have. What we do with our longing when we leave the path of God, we start doing to kind of fulfill that longing on our own. So what I want us to do is I want to look at a very famous story from Matthew chapter 4. And I want to look at 
how even Jesus had to deal with the attacks of this enemy. And how you and I can deal with the attacks of the enemy. So that we can truly live out this eternity that is stamped in our hearts. That we can truly fathom what God is doing in the world. When we look at this. Because Satan has not changed his tactics in 2,000 years. The way he tries to tempt Jesus is the exact same way he tries to tempt you and me as followers of Christ today. So let's read this story together from Matthew chapter 4. It starts off, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. There is the most understated verse in your Bible. Fasting for 40 days. I can't even do three hours. Fast for three hours? I'm a bear. You don't want to be anywhere near me. You want me fasting somewhere else by myself for three hours. I'm hungry. I'll eat you. Okay? <laughs> fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift, up, lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. So here what we're seeing in this passage of your Bible is Jesus is about to begin his public ministry. And what I mean by a public ministry, he's, he's putting himself out there now. He's no more kind of this carpenter's son just living in Nazareth. He's now going to start showing people who he is. He's going to start teaching about the kingdom of God. He is going to start performing miracles. He's going to raise the dead. He's going to heal the blind. He's going to heal the lame. He's going to cast out demons. He's go basically going to upset Every religious person from here to there. <laughs> because he's going to start serving in who he is as God the Son. And it's going to break a lot of paradigms in religion. It's going to show how some teachers don't have authority and he has this authority. So he's prepping for this public ministry by not eating for 40 days in a desert. Can you imagine if that was how we prepared pastors for, you know, instead of going to seminary for three years, we just throw you in the middle of a desert and say, don't eat for 40 days. Then you can start your public ministry. I'm glad that wasn't one of my courses. <laughs> okay. But this is what Jesus did. And it was in one of Je well, Jesus' weakest point as fully human where the devil comes. And isn't that the way it works in your life? <laughs> It's like in the weakest moments, the devil comes. He comes when we're weak. He comes when we're, when we're not kind of keeping our eyes on spiritual things. He comes when we least expect it. When we're hungry, he comes. And so what he does here and what Jesus shows us is the way to deal with these temptations. Basically, Jesus is giving you and I a roadmap on how to overcome temptation in our life. Again, because we have this eternity stamped on our hearts. And if we truly want to live that out, we need to learn how to deal with the temptation that comes. So I want us to look at th the three different temptations here. And we're going to look at how you and I deal with these temptations. So how do, we, how do we overcome temptation in our life? The first is know the word. The first is we need to know the word. Right, when Dr. Stephen Strange finds out that there's this great evil, right, his eyes have been opened. He's a doctor. He's a medical doctor. He can always explain stuff by science. And now the universe has so opened up to him, and his whole mind shift has had to change. 
what he turns to to help him overcome this evil is what he has always known. Study. 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 Now, in the movie, it looks like Stephen Strange studies for about five minutes. Because it would be an awfully boring movie if the movie just showed some guy in a library for five and a half years reading books. Who'd pay to see that movie? Two and a half hours of some guy just reading books. <laughs> right? So they kind of fast forward that in the movie. But he spends months and months and months studying in order to deal with this evil. And the same is true for us as followers of Jesus. Do you know the word? It takes study. It's not easy to know your Bible. It's not easy to understand the Bible. And what we have been doing more and more and more as a Christian culture in North America is trusting our biblical knowledge to fewer and fewer and fewer people. I remember a couple of years ago, I was playing a, a, a board game. And we had a bunch of different age people all around the table, and we were playing this board game. And it was one of those games where you draw a card, and you either have to kind of make the thing on the card out of Play-Doh, or you have to act it out. And so this young girl who was on my team drew a card. She was about 16 years old, drew out this card, and she looks at it, and she has to kind of imitate the person on the card and has no clue who this person is. So I said, okay, well, I won't guess. Like, I'll help you out. And I look at the card, and the card said Moses. Now I'm sitting there going, okay, Moses is spelt funny, so maybe she just didn't know how to pronounce it. I said, oh, no, it's Moses. Blank stare. 16-year-old girl, no clue, no clue who Moses is. I'm like, Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston, Part Red Sea, snakes, blood, water, frogs, locusts, no clue. We don't know the word. And what's happening even more as Christians is what we're doing is we are taking what we want to believe and forcing the Bible to say what we want it to believe. We're taking our view, our cues from culture and saying, well, because culture is going this way and culture is saying this, I'm going to change, I'm going to take my belief and change what the Bible says instead of taking the Bible and making it change what we believe. That's what Jesus did. Right? The tactics of Satan have been the same for thousands of years, is that he will twist the word of God to mean something else that it never was meant to say. He did that to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when God said, you can do anything. You have the whole world before you. I've got one rule. Just one rule. Don't eat that tree. From that, the fruit from that tree. And you parents, you know what this is like, right? When you tell your kids, how many of you bring your kids camping in the summertime and there's a big fire? Don't go near the fire. Where do the kids play? Right beside the fire. It drives me crazy. It's one of the reasons I despise camping. So stressed. These kids running around the fire. It's like, I'm kidding. Oh, you almost want to throw them in just to get, to get it over so they can see how much it hurts. Stop it. It drives me insane. Okay? Well, that's what we do. We hover. One thing don't do. And then Satan shows up and says, did God really say you'll die? He twists the word. You and I need to be men and women, boys and girls who know our Bible. And it's work. I know it is. Okay? I know it is. I wish, I wish when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and we are made a new creation, and the Holy Spirit comes in us, and we're born again, and we're now a temple of God, a temple of God, I wish the Holy Spirit would then just say, now you know the Bible memorized. Wouldn't that be awesome? And he could do that, but he doesn't. Because he wants us to do the hard work. Study it. Read it. Open it. Meditate on it. And this is why as a church, we take knowing the Bible very seriously as a church. 
This is why we don't, I don't share from the front my opinion or what culture says. I will unapologetically say every single Sunday what this book says. And I'm convinced one day I will be arrested. I know it's going to happen. I'm going to be that guy. I know. I can see it coming as clear as day. I'm like, I think I'm a really nice guy. I'm the guy who's going to go to jail for this. It's just coming. It's going to happen. And <laughs> hopefully it'll be a nice jail. Okay. Um, but we need to know the word. We've got to take this seriously. That's why we as church leaders, we're going to we do everything possible to help you know the Bible. And we're going to work on this even more this coming year. One of the things I want to do this coming season one of the, is, is kind of train our life group leaders more. I want to get better at training our life group leaders. One of the things that we do, and I'm going to be honest, this is just a little confession time. One of the things that we do that drives me mental in our Bible studies is when we, go, when we read a passage of the Bible and we go around and go, what do you think this means? 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 Nothing wrong with that. But at the end of the day, there's got to be someone in that room, going, in that room who says, I don't care what you think it says. This is what it says. This is what it means. I don't care about your feelings. I don't care about what culture says. This is what it means. When Jesus says, God said, man shall not live on bread alone. We need to be able to respond, God said, with love and with mercy and with compassion, with joy, but to stand firm on the word of God. So we need to be more in the word of God. That's how we deal, the first way we deal with temptation. Mm -hmm. And that's what Dr. Strange has to do. He has to study. He has to study. He has to study. And study is hard, and it doesn't always pay off. Sometimes even in the most study, things don't go quite well. But watch what happens to Dr. Strange here. There will be times when it feels like the study doesn't work. <laughs> and there will be times when it feels like the study is not worth it. It's worth it. Grow in it. Grow in it. Grow in it. Know the word. And the second thing to help us overcome temptation is to be wise. Is to be wise. Right? Dr. Strange deals with years of medical training and study to help him practice. And in that, he has learned great wisdom. He has learned how to recognize the signs, to read the environment, to kind of read what's going on in a patient. He uses not just knowledge, but wisdom. And the difference between knowledge and wisdom, knowledge is knowledge, it's information. Wisdom is applying it. When, for example, we know smoking is bad for us, that's knowledge. But if you keep smoking, that's not wisdom, <laughs> right? Knowledge is you know something, wisdom is applying it to your life, right? So Dr. Strange goes through all this process. He learns about this great evil in the universe and that the, these other sorcerers have been deceived by this great evil. And so he needs to kind of learn in the way that he used to learn in the medical profession, he needs to use his wisdom to overcome this evil. Right? And this is what, in the second temptation of Jesus, what Satan does, again, he's twisting scripture, and he's attacking God's sovereignty. What he's attacking is God has, has a sovereign plan that Jesus is going to go to the cross. And because God is sovereign, that means nothing can stop God's plan. And so Satan shows up and says, well, because of God's sovereignty, because of God's plan, you can just jump off of this building and the angels are going to protect you because of God's sovereignty. This event still has to happen. And Jesus' response is, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And I think that is a great response because as we are dealing with this longing in our hearts, when we long for more, sometimes you and I jump off the building. When everybody around you tells you not to jump off the building, your parents tell you don't jump off the building, your spouse tells you to don't jump off the building, everyone in your small group is telling you to jump off the building, and you say, I don't care. My feelings are telling me to jump. <laughs> That's not wise. What you do in those moments is you say, God, I don't care about your word. I don't care about the evidence around me. I'm just going to jump. And God, if this is not your will, you're going to bail me out. And Jesus says, do not put your Lord, your God, 
to the test. Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. He's given you a brain. Jesus is okay with you using it. <laughs> Be wise. Don't always live your life in such a way that if Jesus doesn't bail you out, your life would be a train wreck. When temptation comes, we need to be wise, right? We need to use our heads. And then the final way that Jesus deals with temptation is we need to worship God alone. Like the followers of Dormammu, they have come to truly believe they are going to save humanity from their great enemy of time. They think they are the good guys. And so they'll kill everybody else to stop who is trying to stop them. You kind of know you're not the good guy when your plan is to kill everybody else. Okay, that's usually a good rule of thumb. Okay, when people in the world, when groups in the world, when religious fanatics in the world are killing everybody else, probably not the good guy. But they think they're the good guy because they're trying ultimately to overcome this great enemy of time. They've been deceived. They have given their hearts, minds, and soul to someone else, apart from the true path that they should have been walking. Right? And the third temptation that Jesus faces is, who will you worship? Right? With eternity in our hearts, when, when we have this longing for more, when we can't fully fathom God, our hearts will gravitate to worship something else. We'll worship our marriage. We'll worship our children. We'll worship our careers. We'll worship our finances. We'll worship our position of authority in the church or in the community. If you and I are not careful because of this longing, we can easily worship something else. without even knowing it. And this idea is so ingrained in, in Baptist churches that people are thinking I'm a heretic. Mm. And it's this. In our Baptist churches, we have a tendency of saying, we come together and we sing to prepare our hearts for The most important thing in the church. It's not the reason I the preaching of the word of God because one day Jesus is going to proclaim him. better I know a whole lot of singing <laughs> So you might as well practice. And I don't care how bad you sound. I sing over there and I sing my guts out. I'm the worst singer in this room. Trust me. But we preach to make us better worshipers. Not we listen to a few songs to prepare our hearts for the word. Right? We need to worship. And worship is learned. Just like the studying of the word. We learn to worship. I don't know that song. Uh, I'll sing it anyways. I'm out of key, I don't care, I'll sing it anyways. People around me are laughing, I don't care, I'm going to sing it anyway, because it's not about them, it's about Jesus. Mm -hmm. We worship him alone. So Dr. Strange goes from being this complete, total, arrogant man to starting to become, go on the pathway of becoming the Sorcerer Supreme, where he's going to save the world from evil. And this arrogant man who wouldn't even use his talents to save sick people 
finds himself face to face with this great evil. And he kind of creates this time loop in order to take this great evil and take him as his prisoner. And watch what he does here. Again, I said earlier I'm not the type of guy to find Jesus in movies. <laughs> That's probably one of the best pictures I've seen of Jesus in a non-Jesus movie. <laughs> Willing to sacrifice, to leave his position of power, to leave his authority, to lower himself for the love of the entire human race. <laughs> That's what Jesus did. There is a spiritual enemy, and Jesus calls this enemy a thief. And Jesus says this thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And in that longing that we have, we can so easily believe the words of the thief. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life, and may have life to the full. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd. He does not love the sheep. And so when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. Then the wolf will attack the flock and scatter it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. That's how we overcome temptation, is knowing the good shepherd. And if you're here today, and maybe you've never really put your faith in Jesus, it's so simple to do. It starts with knowing that you have something in your life called sin, and that sin has separated you from this creator God. And you can't be religious enough to, to please this God. And he loves you so much, he has sent Jesus to die for you. And you just need to thank him for that. The Bible says if you confess in your, with your tongue that Jesus is Lord, you believe in his heart, in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, you will be made new. And then the Spirit of God comes in you and helps you deal with the temptation in your life so we can gain victory over this thief that wants to take us off this path of eternity. And maybe you're here today and you're struggling with the temptations of life. I pray that the Word of God would encourage you today. That by the Spirit of God in you, you can have victory over the temptation. And I pray for all of us as a church that we would continue to seek God more and more. That we would know his word, that we would be wise, and that we would worship him alone. Because God has got great plans for you and me. And he set that eternity in your heart. Let's pray together.